Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live webcast, Practical Guidance for Successful Mammalian Cell Banking and Cell Line Characterization. I'm Randy Hernandez, Senior Editor of Pharma. Pharmaceutical Technology and Biopharm International. Today's educational webcast is brought to you by Eurofins Lancaster Laboratories. As a member of Eurofins Biopharm Product Testing Group, the largest network of harmonized biopharmaceutical GMP product testing laboratories worldwide, Eurofins Lancaster Laboratories supports all functional areas of biopharmaceutical manufacturing, including method development, microbiology, process validation, and quality control throughout all stages of the drug development process. Now for some important announcements. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the red Q&A widget at the bottom of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can following the presentations. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the small green icon in the upper right-hand corner of the slide window, or by hovering your mouse over the lower right-hand corner and dragging the window to the desired size. The slides will advance automatically during the event. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the question mark help widget in the dock at the bottom of your presentation window. I'm pleased to be joined today by Dr. Jerry Ann Booth, Senior Director, Biopharmaceutical Services, Eurofins Lancaster Laboratories, Lana Mogilyansky, MBA, Manager, Cell Banking, Eurofins Lancaster Laboratories, Dr. Heather Beyer, Group Leader, Principal Scientist, Viral Safety and Viral Clearance Services, Eurofins Lancaster Laboratories, and Dr. Weihang Wang, Techn Technology Development Manager, Eurofins Lancaster Laboratories. Leading off today's presentation is Dr. Jerry Ann Booth. Dr. Booth provides strategic, scientific, and regulatory direction for Eurofins Lancaster Laboratories biochemistry, cell banking, cell and molecular biology, and virology departments. She has more than 25 years of experience in biopharmaceutical testing, including expertise in the formulation of global regulatory product testing strategies and the preparation of global regulatory filings at all stages of product development. She earned a PhD from Georgetown University. Our second presenter is Lana Mogulyansky, MS, MBA. Ms. Mogulyansky is responsible for the design, execution, and documentation for all cell banking projects. She has 19 years of experience in the biotechnology industry, focusing on cell banking and cell line characterization, as well as virology and molecular biology and process evaluations. She earned an MS in biochemistry and molecular biology from Kharkiv National University in Ukraine, an MS in microbiology from Thomas Jefferson University, and an MBA from the Pennsylvania State University. Our third presenter is Dr. Heather Beyer. Dr. Byer has spent 10 years designing, managing, and executing viral clearance projects, as well as performing and overseeing viral safety testing, in including adventitious agent testing, as well as assays for retrovirus. She also has experience designing viral vaccines. She earned a PhD from the Penn State College of Medicine. Our closing presenter is Dr. Wei Hong Wang. Dr. Wong oversees assay development validation projects and serves as a subject matter expert and direct technical contact to assist clients with testing needs. She has 14 years of experience developing and characterizing biopharmaceutical products and has extensive experience with cell and molecular techniques utilized in both product potency as well as safety testing. She earned a PhD in cell and molecular biology from Brandeis University completed postdoctoral research at Harvard Medical School. Jerry Ann, please get us started. Thank you, Randy. Hello, everyone. I'd like to begin our cell banking and cell line characterization webinar with a brief overview of what we'll be discussing today. Our focus will be on mammalian and insect cell banking and cell line characterization, and our goal is to share practical, scientific, 
and regulatory information regarding these topics. Lana will begin her session with a definition of terms and a discussion of the various types of cell banks our clients are requesting. She'll briefly discuss the two-tiered master and working cell bank approach that has proven to be effective with regard to providing continuity in the manufacturing process. She'll then describe the various types of banks that we prepare, from R&D banks to GMP production banks, along with the environmental conditions required for the preparation of each. Lana will also spend some time talking about a relatively new type of bank that the industry refers to as ready to use, or RTU, GMP non-production banks. These banks are specifically generated to support cell-based bioassays, and because they are vialed at high density for immediate use in those assays, there are some unique challenges associated with the preparation of these banks. Heather will go into detail about the type of testing required for each type of cell bank that Lana describes. She will focus on characterizing the banks for the presence of adventitious agents, namely bacteria, fungi, molds, mycoplasma, and spiroplasma, and she'll also talk about testing for a wide range of both adventitious and endogenous viruses. Wei will end the presentations with a discussion of cell identity testing and a description of several commonly used assays for the demonstration of cell line genetic stability. Wei will spend some time discussing alternative assays to the isoenzyme identity test, which has recently become a challenge to perform due to an unexpected and unprecedented scarcity of assay reagents. A running theme throughout the presentations will be the importance of communication between the client and the cell banking and testing laboratories. You'll hear each of our speakers underscore the importance of sharing as much information as early as possible to help ensure the success of your project. And I hope these few comments have set the stage for each of our speakers. So first, we're going to take a brief polling question. You can click directly on your screen to submit your answer. The question is, what type of cell banking do your projects require? R&D banks, production banks, non-production banks, or multiple types? And I'll read that question again. What type of cell banking do your projects require? R&D banks, production banks, non-production banks, or multiple types? Again, please click directly on your screen to submit your answer. So it looks like of the respondents, 52.5% uh, use multiple types of cell banking. Second is 31.1% for production banks. Then the last two are 82.2% each. Back to you, Lana. Hello and good morning, everyone. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm Lana Magdalenska. We'll be talking about cell bank types, definitions, and issues that, that we encountered throughout our work with cells. Um, I would like to start with a brief definition of uh, cell banks and classification of a cell bank. Um, you can find multiple ways to classify cell banks, but I would, do, uh, I would classify it by historical progression, uh, which would be going from research cell bank to master cell bank and to the working cell bank. And uh, another classification <coughs> would be in relation to GMP, which would be non-GMP cell banks, GMP non-production cell banks, or bioassay banks, and GMP production cell banks. Um, GMP cell banks, yeah, I'm trying to click. So, um, master cell banks and working cell banks, uh, definition of master and working cell banks you can find in ICH guidelines for industry. 
Uh, master cell bank is defined as an aliquot of a single pool of cells that generally has been prepared from selected cell clones under defined conditions, dispensed into multiple containers, and sto stored under defined conditions. Master cell bank is usually prepared from research and development or R&D cell bank. Uh, working cell bank is prepared from a master cell bank. Sometimes uh, multiple master cell banks need to be produced, and then you have to go to the original research bank and produce another master cell bank. Important thing to note is that uh, you characterize first MCB a certain way, you expect it to characterize the same MCB, uh, the second MCB the same way. I will not uh, get, uh, get deeply into characterization. Uh, it will be next to presenters. So um, they'll talk about this in great details. But I will just say that um, cell bank characterization can be very involved if it is um, a production cell bank and not so involved if it's a non-production cell bank. Uh, there are general requirements for characterization of any kind of banks that when it's produ produced uh, under GMP condition, um, like mycoplasma and sterility testing, but the rest of the uh, characterization can vary. GMP cell banks, um, you have usually uh, two major types of GMP cell banks. It's production and non-production banks. Uh, the difference is uh, pretty significant. Production banks, uh, Cells will be used to make some sort of a product. Uh, it requires very strict uh, environment for production. They usually produce in ISO 57 or AB suites. Uh, they mostly produce one bank at a time, uh, unless there is a specific uh, request from the client to produce two banks, let's say it's the same clone and there is a tight timeline. There can be a specific request made. However, it's very unusual. Uh, and another difference between production and non-production banks is that for production banks, environmental monitoring uh, throughout the process is a must. And uh, environmental monitoring includes environmental monitoring of a hood, of a room, as well as environmental monitoring of the personnel involved in the production. Uh, Non-production bank banks, uh, bioassay banks, typically, um, they are produced in non-campaign mode. Uh, and here it's other way around. It can be produced in campaign mode. Uh, we do that if client specifically requires that. However, usually it is produced in non-campaign mode, a few banks at the time in the same room. However, obviously only one cell line can be at the biosafety cabinet at the time. Um, and there are certain uh, procedures used that to, to make sure that um, there is no cell line contamination. Um, no EM uh, use provided during um, non-production banks. They usually require less characterization. Uh, however, what we found out that they very often have more strict acceptance criteria than production banks. And um, well, we, we often uh, see ready-to-use bank requests, which is a new, um, new type to me. It's a subtype of GMP non-production banks when uh, pretty much cells go right from the vial into the assay, in the bioassay. And it seems to be emerging trend for cell-based potency assays. Um, and what it does, it eliminates expansion of cells prior to lottery release, uh, which means that uh, usually uh, people request very large banks because they go through them very fast, 500 vials, 400 vials or more. The largest bank we had so far was 1,100 vials. Um, and expansion details become very, very essential uh, to, to ensure that cell bank performance is expected in the bioassay. Uh, and we have um, client requested requesting viabilities of greater than 90% uh, on the, this kind of banks. And uh, with the industry standard for production banks, let's say, to be higher than, greater than 70%, which is a huge difference. Um, we do advise pilot studies when scaling up from small banks to very large banks because uh, let's say if you had experience banking those cells 
preparing 50 wild banks, and now you want to prepare 1,000 wild bank. It's not. It may not work exactly the same way. Um, you will deal with large volumes of cells. There will be a lot of time spent during the harvest. You know, some cells will be sitting on ice waiting for another cells to to come together. Uh, the full harvest can take quite a few hours, versus 10 to 50 wild bank that can be harvested in half an hour, and. Some cells do very well with that, and some cells don't. So one of the advices I would like to, to give is do not expect that large bank is going to uh, behave the same way and that there will be no issues. So um, it would, it's nice usually to do some study uh, to make sure that cells can actually tolerate uh, very well um, sitting on ice for a while. and. Uh, spending some time in freeze media. Non-GMP banks or ND banks um, usually prepare it under the same general rules as GMP banks. Um, the only difference is that they don't get any QA involvement or QA review. There's only technical review on the paperwork that you will get. So that's pretty much the only difference. Um, and everything else would be the same. They would be produced pretty much under the same uh, conditions as GMP non-production banks. Uh, very often people ask, what is that make cell banking projects successful? Because cell ba preparation of a cell bank, it is a big project. It's not, it's not a, a, an assay that, that you run and just get it done and over with. It involves a lot of people. It involves a lot of steps. And uh, it's unique, and unfortunately, cells have tendencies to surprise us um, because they're biosystems and not chemical reagents. My suggestion is to give all information up front, every little detail you can think of. Uh, we like to get technical people on the phone as early as possible in the process. Um, the reason is that usually if you deal with subcontracting laboratory, um, you will get some sort of questionnaire to fill out. And um, that questionnaire will ask key questions that, that are important to know in order to produce a cell bank. However, there can be some details that technical people will share when they talk and technical details that are not included in this general questionnaire. Uh, these details can be quite important. So. Um, Ideally, that would be where you start. And then um, another ideal situation is if you have R&D cell bank and it's not characterized yet. And in order to make GMP cell bank, you need to do certain characterization testing. So ideal situation is when we get your cells prior to doing a bank for expansion uh, for characterization tests. That gives us time to look into the growth tendencies and see whether we, we have any issues, problems, questions additionally. Um, we can do it without it, but it is an additional benefit. Always expect that um, your cell line is finicky. Uh, the cell growth may differ between laboratories. They may simply like some type of incubators more than others. Usually it's not the case, but there are exemptions from the rules, and uh, it's something to look at. Uh, also, once again, please take into consideration scale-up issues, that uh, your experience with preparation of a small cell bank may significantly differ from preparation of a large cell bank, um, once again, due to the, the length of a harvest, mostly. Um, it, may very, it may be very, very different and very surprising. And when you choose con contract cell bank in a uh, contract laboratory, a few things you need to I suggest to look at at least. Um, if you are looking into preparation of a GMP cell bank, obviously the first thing you do is to audit quality systems. And another important part is to meet and to look at the key personnel and backup personnel. Um, you need to know who is going to be physically making your cell bank. Not who is in charge, but who is physically making it, and how many people are available. If it's one person, that's a bit of a problem, because if something happens, you don't have a backup. 
Uh, you need to have a group of people that is capable, equally capable of produ producing cell banks and have significant experience in the field. You also need to look at backup personnel and their experience. Um, you need to look at management availability in case of an issue. Um, how will that be handled? Openness of communication. If there is a problem, uh, how quickly do you notify about the issue with your cell bank or with the equipment? Is it going to be that very moment or is it going to be a week from the event? Uh, you need to know, right, you need to be told right away if there is a problem. Uh, and the last point would be uh, willingness of company to accept responsibility for the imperfect bank. Sometimes all procedures and rules are followed. However, the result is not exactly what you hoped for. Uh, the viability is lower. Um, you look at the cells in your assay and something doesn't seem right. Uh, what would the company do? Um, we always viewed relationship with the client as partnership. So we always try to work together on issue resolution. And there will be issues sometimes due to the nature of uh, cell culture. Uh, and talking about as about a cell banking as a big project, large project, uh, you need to ensure a proper communication during cell banking process. Uh, working from with the client from start to finish, uh, from the very beginning when purchase order is signed to the very end when all characterization is finished and COA is created and the shipments, you know, start occurring to, to the client site. Uh, it's a large project, and we have uh, here multiple um, management management structures involved in the process, um, which provides constant communication, um, which is very important during batch record preparation and preparation of cell bank itself, uh, and, as well as post bank testing. Provide 24/7 access to cell banking group in case of criticality of your bank, um, and I think it's pretty important uh, considering the fact that uh, sometimes critical things like sub passes or harvests happen on the weekend, and if you want to be notified about it, you absolutely will be. Um, and we also have dedicated cell bank and project manager that will be with you throughout the whole process as well as technical management that will be handling all the technical issues and will be available for discussions at any given point. That concludes my part of the presentation. Okay, now we're going to take another brief polling question. So to answer, you can click directly on your screen to submit your answer. What type of production system are you working with? Cho, mouse, human, insect, or other? I'll repeat the question. What type of production system are you working with? Cho, mouse, human, insect, or other? And we'll wait one moment just to get the results. And let's pull up the top line results. So it looks as if 53.7% uh, of respondents are working with the CHO production system. After that, the second is human with 25.6%. Heather, do you have anything to add? Uh, well, throughout my presentation, I will be discussing the considerations for the testing plans um, as they relate to the different systems. Um, that a client may be working with. So now that you've heard about the considerations for manufacturing a cell bank from Lana, I will focus on the design of the testing plan to ensure purity and safety of your cell bank. So to ensure product safety, you need to implement a comprehensive testing program that encompasses the life of your, your product, starting with control and testing of raw materials, through testing of each bulk production lot. Uh, today, my focus will be characterization of the source material or cell bank. So when designing a testing plan, you need to consider the type of cell bank that you have prepared. 
as the rationale for testing differs depending upon the type of cell bank that you're producing. For example, when we look at testing of non-production banks, the testing plan differs as, compar as compared to production banks. So first I'm going to focus on non-production considerations. Um, so these would include seed cells, um, which are used to, uh, which are expanded to generate a master cell bank, and non-production cells. These would be cells for analytical assays. Both seed cells and non-production cells um, would the expectation is that sterility testing and mycoplasma testing would be performed on both. And both would be shown to be sterile and mycoplasma free. Um, in fact, we expect um, seed cells to be shown to be sterile and mycoplasma free before even bringing them into our facility. Um, additional considerations for non-production cells would be focusing on the performance of the cells in whatever bioassay they are intended for. Um, and in this case, you would want to consider the assay specifications and how they relate to your cells. When focusing on production cell bank testing, um, again, the considerations or your testing plan would differ depending on um, the cell bank that you're producing. For master cell banks, these are the starting material for your whole production process. And the regulatory expectation is that a full characterization is performed for microbial and viral contaminants. This would be a one-time test unless a change is made to your master cell bank. For working cell banks, these are only a couple passages beyond the master cell bank generally. Um, so these show, uh, or, or we would see, a reduced package of testing for, for working cell banks. For cells at the limit of in vitro cell age or end of production cells, these would be a worst case scenario for amplification of any contaminants which might be present. And again, a full characterization um, of any contaminants is expected, and this would also be a one-time test. So the major concern for cell line characterization and product safety is assurance that there are no adventitious agents in the bank or product. Adventitious agent is something that is not intended to be present in the biological product. These can include bacteria, fungi, mold, mycoplasma or spiroplasma, and viruses. Testing for these agents addresses both product safety and purity. So first I'm going to focus on testing for bacteria, fungi, and mold. These can be introduced through starting materials such as cell lines or through raw materials which are, can be of either animal origin or plant-derived material. They can be introduced by operators or ineffective facility cleaning, and bacteria can thrive in extreme environments. These are typically controlled by inactivation and robust sterile filtration procedures. So the sterility testing is performed according to Compendia. It involves the direct inoculation of cells into two different types of media. These are incubated for 14 days at aerobic and anaerobic conditions. Samples are observed for turbidity. And the expectation is that cell banks, that 1% of the total cell bank, or a minimum of two vials, is tested. In addition, bacteriostasis and fungostasis testing is performed in order to assess sample matrix for any inhibition in the assay. So when is sterility testing performed? Basically, sterility testing is performed for all cell banks, whether they are production or non-production banks. Next, we'll focus on mycoplasma and spiroplasma. Um, as mycoplasma are common cell culture contaminants, these are small bacteria that lack cell walls. Uh, common sources of mycoplasma contamination include cell culture media and additives, cells themselves, and laboratory personnel. Mycoplasma contamination can lead to altered cellular metabolism, disruption of nucleic acid synthesis, and changes in gene expression or cell membrane antigenicity. A mycoplasma are associated with human disease, such as respiratory diseases like walking pneumonia, pneumonia or pelvic inflammatory disease. Um, so these are of an important safety concern. Infections can also affect the yield of biological products. 
And these, as I mentioned earlier, are definitely a regulatory requirement for biopharmaceuticals. Um, some additional considerations, mycoplasma are inactivated by heat, extreme pH, and gamma irradiation. And they can be introduced by ineffective facility cleaning, as biofilms can survive heat as high as 95 degrees Celsius. Filtrate, filtration through a 0.1 micron filter can be effective if validated for matrix effects. This is not considered a sterilizing step, considering the size of mycoplasma. So mycoplasma testing um, meets the requirements established in the common regulatory agencies. Um, the current testing procedures are 28 days in duration and have three different components. There is detection on indicator cells, a direct cultivation onto auger plates, and incubation in broth followed by auger sub subculture. Um, in addition, mycoplasma stasis is performed in order to assess the sample matrix for inhibition in the test. In addition, rapid myco testing methods are also offered. Like sterility, it's expected that mycoplasma testing is performed on all cell banks, both production and non-production. So next, I'm going to focus on the detection and testing for viral adventitious agents. Adventitious agents can be introduced through the starting material, cell lines, blood, or tissue, and also through contaminated raw materials, such as bovine serum, trypsin, or other animal and non-animal derived raw materials. MMV, or murine minute virus, is a common contaminant that has been shown in the industry. Um, it's been shown to come from both contaminated raw materials as well as contaminated facilities and operators. Uh, just a little bit about viruses. Um, they're parasites, and they need a cell to replicate. And they range in both size and sensitivity to different physical and chemical inactivation methods. So prior to testing your cell line for, virus, uh, for adventitious viruses, you need to perform a risk assessment. Some questions that you need to consider. What is the origin and history of the cell line that you're using? Um, and this is critical to have an accurate history. Has the cell line been exposed to serum or trypsin? And if so, was it irradiated? Again, there are a number of incidents in the um, history of biological products of contamination events which originated from serum trypsin, and other media components. Was your cell line exposed to other cell species or substances derived from other species? What non-animal additives may your cell line have been exposed to? What viruses is your cell line susceptible to? So it's important to, to identify the risks when you develop your testing plan. Besides adventitious agents, um, it's also important to consider what endogenous viruses might be present in your cell line. These are viruses which belong there um, in the source material. Uh, many, cell, many rodent cells are known to have retroviruses, which are integrated into the genome. So this is a common concern. Um, also, oncogenic viruses may have been used to create the cell line. Um, so these are all important considerations um, besides adventitious agents. When designing your virus testing plan, you're going to need to include a number of different assays to detect a wide range of possible contaminants. These would include broad specificity assays, in vitro and in vivo virus assays, and an electron microscopy to characterize any retrovirus which might be present, assays to detect contaminants associated with specific species of concern. Um, so they could be rodent, human, bovine, or porcine virus screens and also assays to detect retroviruses. So these would be electron microscopy, infectivity assays, or biochemical assays. So the in vitro viral screening assays are based on the principle that viruses will replicate in a suitable host cell. 
presence of virus is detected by cytopathic effects, or CPE, in the indicator cells, hemagglutination or hemadsorption of red blood cells um, at different points in the assay. Indicator cell lines are selected based on the theoretical susceptibility to the different viruses of concern. So a human diploid cell line, MRC5, and a primate cell line, Vero, are used to detect viruses which are infectious for human cells. Third, indicator cell line of the same or similar cell type as the cell substrate is used to detect viruses infectious for those cells. Um, additional cell lines may be added for particular pathogens of concern. For example, if you are concerned about the presence of MMV, um, many clients add A9 or 324K cells to their testing panel in order to de detect this pathogen. So in the in vitro viral assay, indicator cells are exposed to the test article, and these are indi then incubated for two to four weeks and observed under a microscope for the appearance of cy cytopathic effects. Um, the test cultures are compared to negative control cultures as well as positive control cultures. And at the termination of the assay, HA and HAD testing is performed. Uh, matrix interference testing is also recommended, um, and this is analyzed by spiking model viruses into the test article and ensuring appropriate recovery of the positive control. For in vivo assays, in vivo assay testing, these are based on the principle that viruses that don't cause cytopathology or other noticeable effects in a cell culture system may be detectable in animal systems. The animals that are used include suckling and adult mice, guinea pigs, and embryonated chicken eggs. The animals are observed for clinical signs every working day of the specified test period. So this slide is simply for your future reference, and this, this highlights a number of different viruses which are detected using the in vivo virus assay system. So adventitious virus testing is typically not performed on non-production banks, um, but is performed for all production banks, master cell banks, working cell banks, and end of production cells. So for cells with a known exposure to bovine and porcine agents, such as trypsin or serum, bovine and or porcine screen testing is recommended. Um, in these screens, they detect a wide variety of bovine or porcine viruses by the presence of cytopathic effects and hemadsorption of red blood cells in the indicator cells. They are also, the, the indicator cells are also stained at the end of the assay um, with, with immunofluorescent staining specific for the bovine and porcine pathogens. So in the procedure, um, the your cell lysate uh, or raw materials such as serum or trypsin are inoculated onto indicator cells. And these are monitored for CPE for 21 days, and they undergo subculturing twice to allow amplification of any contaminants. Um, the cells are then tested for HAD at the end of the 21 days, and the cells are stained and fixed with anti-bovine or anti-porcine um, fluorescent labeled antibodies. So the bovine screen includes staining for eight specific viruses shown here, which meet 9 CFR and EMA requirements. And it also includes um, a parainfluenza virus control, which serves as a hemadsorption positive control in the assay. And the porcine screen includes staining for these seven specific viruses, again, which meet 9 CFR and EMA requirements. And they, this also includes a parainfluenza control for hemadsorption. So when is the bovine and porcine virus screening performed? This is typically only performed on the master cell bank and end of production cells. And again, this would also be performed on raw materials, such as serum or trypsin. For cells that are derived from rodent species, or in which rodent viruses are a specific concern, 
Um, antibody production testing would also be included in the testing package. This is a sensitive method for detecting adventitious rodent viruses. Viral antibody-free animals are injected with a test article. Serological analyses are performed at the end of the incubation period to determine if antibodies were produced against specific viruses. These tests can be performed in mouse, rat, and hamster. Um, in the procedure, the cell lysate is inoculated via a variety of routes, and the animals are bled after 28 days and tested for virus-specific antibody by ELISA or immunofluorescent staining. Again, for your reference, this slide summarizes a number of viruses uh, which are capable of replicating in human or pri primate cells, um, which are detected in the antibody production test. This testing is typically performed, again, at the master cell bank and end of production cells. Um, however, you know, while we've talked a lot of, uh, about a lot of different assays already, um, not all viruses will be detected in the broad screens that we've previously talked about. Um, so you may want to consider the addition of virus-specific qPCR assays to your testing panel depending on your risk assessment. Um, examples of these can include detection of Vesey virus, Cash Valley virus, porcine circoviruses, and we also offer PCR panels for um, various different species of viruses. When would um, these virus-specific assays be implemented? Again, these would be at the master cell bank and end of production cell. So the last series of tests that I'm going to focus on, focus on the detection of retroviruses. Um, these are typically not considered adventitious agents, as they may be endogenous to your ma manufacturing cell line. Um, insertion, insertion of the virus into the recipient cell genome can result in transformation or tumorigenicity. Um, it can result in inactivation or overexpression of gene and cell death. And retroviruses are associated with serious immunosuppressive and degenerative conditions. So these are a major safety concern. So it's important to demonstrate the absence of infectious retrovirus um, in your product or in your cells, um, as well as showing that your downstream purification process can adequately remove these viruses. Some basic considerations. Retroviruses have the capacity to remain latent within cells, and not all cell lines are susceptible to a given retrovirus. Many retroviruses infect and replicate in the absence of obvious cytopathology and are not detected by HA or HAD testing. So these won't be detected in the broad screens that we've talked about previously. Instead, specific co-cultivation procedures based upon cytopathology um, need to be used in order to detect infectious retrovirus. So murine leukemia viruses are common rodent retroviral contaminants. Um, these rarely produce obvious cytopathology in vitro, with the exception of a few specialized test systems which we offer. Um, XC, we have an XC plaque assay which detects ecotropic MULV these are retroviruses which replicate in murine cells. Um, we also have S plus or minus focus assays which can be used to detect xenotropic and polytropic viruses. Um, these are murine viruses that replicate in non-murine cells or in a wide host range. Um, polytropic can, in, can infect both a wider range of non-murine and murine cells. Um, these are a particular safety concern um, in that they have the potential to better infect human cells. Um, in addition, we have co-cultivation assays that we offer in which susceptible target cells, um, examples of which are shown, are co-cultivated with a cell line of interest. The target cells are subpassaged to allow amplification of any retrovirus which might be present. And this is then followed by detection of infectious virus in a secondary plaque assay or by PCR detection using a PERT assay, which relies on detection of viral reverse transcriptase. 
Alternatively, there are also a number of other assays which can be implemented for retroviral detection. Um, these include the PERT assay, which I mentioned as a secondary assay for the co-cultivation, um, PCR or RT-PCR for viral nucleic acid, immunofluorescence staining for viral proteins, as well as electron microscopy. Um, uh, when using implement or electron microscopy, um, you can look at both the presence of retrovirus, the relative number per cell, the intracellular location of the virus, as well as the morphology. This retrovirus testing is also typically performed on the master cell bank and end of production cells. So when considering your testing plan, it's important to think about not just what assays you're going to perform, but the implications of your assay results. So cell-based and animal assays detect virus by the effects of infection on the cells or animals. Um, this, they also often include an amplification process, which increases the sensitivity of the assay. On the other hand, molecular assays will detect gene sequences, so you can't determine if they're infectious. Um, these can lead to kind of false positive results by detecting a virus fragment, which isn't actually um, infectious. So you really should consider um, what is important for you to know um, about your cells. And typically, you, you probably want to know both. Um, so they're probably both important to include in your testing plan. So this slide simply summarizes the standard testing timelines associated with all of the adventitious agent testing, um, which I've discussed. Um, the testing timelines range from 17 business days all the way to seven weeks for some of the um, animal-based testing. So while purity and safety testing are critical to cell bank characterization, these aren't the only testing considerations for your bank. Identity and genetic stability are additional characterization tests that are expected, um, and these will be discussed in the next portion of the presentation. So we're going to take a final polling question. You can click directly on your screen to submit your answer. And the question is, what genetic stability testing do you typically perform on your cell banks? Sequencing, northern blotting, southern blotting, or copy number by qPCR? The question again is, what genetic stability testing do you typically perform on your cell banks? Sequencing, northern blotting, southern blotting, or copy number by qPCR. And we're just waiting for responses, and let's pull up our top line results. So it appears that uh, sequencing with 39.6% is the stability testing that is most performed. Uh, followed closely by copy number by qPCR with 37.5%. Thanks for taking the polling question. Um, Wei, Wei, do you have any comments? Yeah, I think it's interesting that the uh, sequencing and uh, copy number by qPCR become the predominant um, assays that people perform on their cell bank. So I'm glad to have this information, and uh, I will start my portion which is related uh, to the poll, uh, that is to focus on genetic stability and identity testing for mammalian and insect uh, recombinant production cell banks. Um, I'm sure you know, all of you understand why the identity testing is important because it is really self-explanatory. The testing confirms that the bank is what you expect it to be at least from the perspective of the origin of the species for the cell line that you use. But for genetic stability testing, um, exactly why do we need it? First, um, from a scientific point of view, genomic events such as deletions, rearrangements, and mutations of genes may occur. And as a consequence, it may alter the expression of the recombinant gene that you're trying to express. In particularly important is because many expression systems utilize 
selection pressure to isolate and maintain the cell line. Under such conditions, cell lines are often even more prone to genetic alterations. Therefore, the stability of the cell line is really critical to the production because any instability may result in altered products, causing both concerns with its efficacy as well as safety. From a manufacturer's operational perspective, a stable cell line is also required to ensure that consistent productivity from each planned manufacturing campaign throughout the life of the, uh, the product. So we know testing for genetic stability is important, but exactly what does the testing entail? Typically, genetic stability includes methods to demonstrate integrity of product transcript. This can be accomplished um, using cDNA sequencing, which is one of the uh, testing that a lot of you guys have already employ employing. Um, the cDNA sequencing can rule out point mutations. Um, the other method that characterizes the product transcript is the northern blood analysis. Northern blood analyses determine the appropriate transcript size. In addition, for overall structure analyses of the recombinant gene integration, restriction endonucleus mapping using southern blood analyses can be performed. Additionally, a product gene copy number is measured, typically using qPCR methods. For these um, more or less a standard testing, you know, it has been pretty common to be performed uh, by sponsors. However, um, there seems to be a trend in the industry in the recent years um, that some sponsors have started to take advantage of the next-gen sequencing technology to perform whole genome sequencing of their production cell line and also to perform direct mRNA sequencing to further substantiate cell line characterization. Although there has not been any clear guidance from the regulatory agents um, in these particular testing. So now um, let's look at each of these methods in a little more detail. For cDNA sequencing, what we have is RNA transcript is first isolated from the cell line and then reverse transcribed into cDNA and further amplified in PCR reactions. The PCR product is then subjected to Sanger sequencing. Multiple sense and anti-sense primers are used in order to generate overlapping reads. This will provide more coverage um, for both directions, sense and anti-sense directions, and ensure the uh, sequence integrity. So cDNA sequencing seems to be adopted by many uh, sponsors as indicated by PO as well. Um, it can obviously detect point mutations within the coding region. However, uh, northern analysis is more adept to detect aberrant size to transcript that often cannot be picked up by sequencing due to design of uh, Sanger sequencing method. In northern analysis, probe that covers entire open reading frame of the product will hybridize with any related transcript as long as they contain part of the coding region. Therefore, um, it can detect aberrant size to transcript that most likely were caused by gene rearrangement or deletion insertion within the recombinant gene. Um, I want to say that, you know, even though the aberrant uh, transcript can occur, it may or may not necessarily lead to a aberrant protein. Nevertheless, the, if a aberrant size to transcript is actually identified, um, it is an indication that some sort of um, instability has occurred uh, within the cell line, and it is of a concern. So in addition to the northern analyses and the cDNA sequencing that uh, aim to characterize the RNA transcript, um, another method uh, which is the southern analysis, um, can also help um, detect the recombinant events. Um, in this method, genomic DNA is isolated from the production cells 
and then digest it with the appropriate set of restriction enzymes that can cut the expression plasmid. Digestion pattern of the genomic DNA provides a high-level structure analysis at integrating sites. An altered digestion pattern between different stages of the cell line development and or between the master cell bank, working cell bank, and end of production cells can suggest a possible gene rearrangement and or deletion event. Even when there's no gene rearrangement event that may impact transcript integrity, it is still possible and quite likely that the cell line is losing copies of the entire gene. In mammalian expression systems, multiple copies of the product gene are often inserted into the whole cell genome. It has been shown that uh, gene copy number per genome loosely correlates to productivity, although productivity does tend to plateau due to other limitations of cell physiology and bioreactor environments. As I have um, briefly mentioned before, often under selection pressure, deletion of gene copies cause uh, reduced productivity and preferential growth of the undesired cell population. Um, historically, copy number has been determined using southern analyses, but qPCR method has been considered the current industry standard due to its superior sensitivity, accuracy, and precision. For the qPCR method, we're able to use a standard curve generated from non-copies of product gene, um, and then the copy number can be interpolated after normalizing, normalizing with whole cell genome content. Well, you can see genetic stability really involves multiple methodologies, as we have just discussed. The last testing that I'll talk about, uh, which is the cell identity testing, has historically been performed using isoenzyme analyses. Isoenzyme analyses is based on the species-specific bending pattern of a selected set of enzymes in cell lysate when it's run on an agarose gel. The method was rather ancient, uh, developed over 40 years ago, and, and um, suffered a few drawbacks that we now know. First of all, uh, the method relies on measurements of migration distance of the enzyme that are difficult to be accurate, um, and then to come to the conclusion of the cell identity, the analyst has to use a process of elimination, which sometimes results in difficult data interpretation. In general, it is also not capable of differentiating between individual human cell lines. Due to the design and um, intended use, it's problematic in identifying hybrid cell lines. For example, a human and a mouse hybrid cell line, as you can imagine, because it was originally designed to identify a single species instead of any hybrid system. And that does not occur naturally. Um, the low sensitivity of the method also makes it hard to detect cell line cross-contamination, which is one of the um, goal for cell identity testing. Finally, as uh, Jerry has alluded to, uh, the test kit is essentially provided by one single vendor. Some of you in the audience may have um, the experience or be aware of a recent and uh, still ongoing reagent shortage that Jerry mentioned, and this really sent some sponsors in panic mode and actually heightened the necessity for an alternative to reduce operational risk. So what um, alternatives do we have with respect to cell identity testing? Good news is that um, technology has really evolved to be on isoenzyme analysis, and in particular, two molecular biology-based methods um, are considered viable options. For determination of mammalian and insect species, the cytochrome oxidase DNA barcoding method has been utilized very often, but up to now, uh, mostly outside of the biopharm industry. The um, cytochrome oxidase 1 gene, or CO1 gene, is a conserved mitochondria gene. In particular, the first 648 base pair of this gene uh, really presents substantial interspecies variation 
but remarkably minimal intraspecies variation. This um, attribute really makes it suitable for species determination. And due to the work that has been done in the last 10 years or so, a database um, containing sequences from a wide range of species has been established and maintained for public to use. For um, CO1 barcoding, uh, first, with properly designed primer in a multiplex PCR, identification can be easily made uh, for most commonly used mammalian species uh, within the biofarm industry. And, and it's based on the uh, different uh, PCR amplicon sites. Uh, if you want to have further authentication, and uh, also perhaps has the need to identify a wider range of species. Sequencing analyses um, of the PCR amplicon can then be performed and the results be compared to the database uh, in order for the species to be determined. Um, CO1 barcoding has been proven to be a more sensitive alternative compared to isoenzyme analyses. And because of that, it really makes um, detection of the cross-contamination uh, easier. From an operational perspective, the CO1 barcoding method uses a standard molecular biology reagents and instrumentations. Therefore, testing does not rely on any particular vendor supply. So we talked about CO1 barcoding. Um, while CO1 barcoding can identify cell line at species level, for cell line that um, is of a human origin, sometimes further authentication is needed um, on an individual donor level. And this can be done using, um, sorry, using the short term, short tandem repeat analyses. Short tandem repeat analyses um, takes advantage of the selected set of short repeat sequences with varying number of copies in individuals. This uh, polymorphism really makes the method capable of unambiguously authenticate human cell lines. Uh, because of this, an initiative for standardized procedure uh, has also been started and promoted by American National Standard Institute and its partner organization, ATCC, which I'm sure all of you uh, is very familiar with. But currently, there are multiple commercially available STR test kits, and this also makes the testing extremely easy to implement and maintain for QC purposes. So I have talked about um, the why and what of genetic stability and identity testing. It is um, also important to consider when these testing should be implemented. It is pretty clear that the regulatory guidance um, require that testing be performed on each master cell bank because that's one of the most critical banks that you have uh, for the product. Uh, not only does the testing assure that the master cell bank is suitable for intended use, the results also pretty much set the baseline for subsequent samples to compare to. In particular, um, end of production cells should also be tested and their results, again, compared to those of the master cell bank. It is noted that not every single lot of end of production cells perhaps will require testing, but testing should be performed whenever changes are introduced into the cell culture process. Um, for example, um, if end of production testing is performed or has been performed on a pilot uh, material pilot process, it is in general advised that testing be repeated when product um, is moved into full commercial scale because of the cell culture differences and, and perhaps the uh, passage number that cell culture has to go through before the end of the production. For working cell bank, um, as Heather has uh, also pointed out, the testing requirement uh, is less stringent. Although um, there is really no absolute requirement by the regulatory agent, uh, we recommend, and I think most of people would agree, that at least identity testing should be performed so you know um, the cell bank is what you want to be. Um, the genetic stability testing 
is um, not mandated for working cell bank as I have just mentioned. However, um, some sponsors choose to perform them on their working cell banks, especially if they choose not to perform the testing on end of production cells until later, such as in the case when they're still working out cell culture processes. Um, so this is really uh, the end of my por portion of the presentation. Um, and I hope that the information is useful to you. Um, so I will hand it back to you, jerry -Ann. Hey, thank you, Wei. Um, just a few closing remarks. Um, I certainly hope we've achieved our goal of defining the critical elements of the cell bank preparation and characterization process. I believe our speakers have covered a large amount of scientific and regulatory information in their individual presentations, and they've also shared what we consider to be best practices for these types of projects. It goes without saying that having the appropriate scientific and regulatory expertise available is essential for the success of such a project. However, for work as important as the preparation of a cell bank and demonstrating it to be suitable for purpose, many of the most important best practices center around the timely sharing of information between client, contractor, and regulators, as well as careful planning and preparation for the project well in advance of project initiation. And with that, we can now open the floor for, for questions from our audience. Thank you all for your insight and informative presentations. And at this time, uh, we'll begin the Q&A portion of our program. I'd like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the red Q&A widget at the bottom of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. Our first question is for Jerry Ann. Will the isoenzyme alternatives be accepted by the FDA? Well, as, as you might imagine, we, we certainly asked ourselves that question prior to initiating the development of our CO1 uh, barcoding procedure. We also consulted with numerous experts throughout the industry. And in short, um, our experience with the regulators is that there is a general willingness to accept new assays as long as there is a sound scientific rationale for accepting that assay. And we firmly feel that that's the case with CO1 barcoding. Um, it is our opinion that CO1 barcoding is far more accurate and robust than isoenzyme analysis. Um, with an isoenzyme analysis, your, your results are typically reported as a sample being consistent with a given species of origin. And in contrast, CO1 barcoding will definitively identify the, C the species of the cells being tested. I would also highlight that CO1 barcoding has much more breadth of coverage at the animal species level than does the isoenzyme analysis. The isoenzyme kit provides a database for 25 or fewer animal species, whereas in contrast, CO1 barcoding can identify literally thousands <coughs> of species. And finally, I would underscore that we're aware that a standard document on species level identification of animal cells through CO1 barcoding is now being authored at the ATCC Standards Development Organization. And this makes us and, and the experts that we consulted with um, think that CO1 barcoding is going to be the primary replacement for isoenzyme analysis for identity at the species level and we absolutely see no reason why regulatory agencies should object to this replacement. Thanks, Darian. Um, our next question is for Heather. Uh, should PERT testing be performed on CHO cell banks? Um, yeah, so most sponsors will still perform uh, PERT testing. Um, typically, though, this is for information only. Since it's established that CHO cells often have retroviral-like particles, um, and they may have detectable reverse transcriptase activities. Um, it's important to understand that you know, RT activity doesn't equate to presence of infectious replicating retrovirus, which is really your main concern. Um, so for that purpose, you know, the retrovirus co-cultivation assay um, would be more applicable with either a CPE or PERT endpoint. 
think that would be more appropriate. Okay, great. Um, our next question is for Wei. Are all the genetic stability assays discussed required? Well, it really depends on, um, you know, the flow of your process. As um, I have mentioned in my slide, that the uh, testing for master cell bank is a must. Um, all those methods that I've discussed uh, were cited in the regulatory guidance documents. So I think it would be a good idea for the, the sponsor to be performing them on their cell bank, master cell bank in particular. Um, typically, it's a one-time testing requirement. However, um, some of the uh, sponsors do, you know, choose a selective um, subset of the methods to perform at a predetermined interval for their master cell bank just to make sure that the master cell bank um, quality-wise has not uh, deteriorated. Um, so I think the requirement for, for master cell bank is pretty clear. And the end of production cells, obviously, you really need information on a representative uh, manufacturing runs um, that, that, again, uh, can be performed on selected um, subset of end of production cells and whenever there is a change in the process development um, arena. With the working cell bank, um, again, it's not a absolute or mandated requirement, but I, I think I have seen, you know, many sponsors chose to perform a subset of um, the test and, and consistent with the poll that we have just um, saw, uh, copy number um, seems to be a very important method for many sponsors to perform on their working cell bank. And I also want to add that um, we've seen more and more sponsors start to perform these testing or at least to start to uh, try to characterize their, their research cell bank prior to them making a decision to select any particular research cell bank and move them into the master cell bank stage. Thank you, Wei. Um, our next question is for Lana. What additional information is needed to prepare a non-production bioassay bank versus a production cell bank? Well, there is no difference in what information we need on non-production bioassay banks versus production banks. Uh, it's just that we would like to get all information uh, about how, if you handled that cell, let the cell line before, if it's not just the cell line from ATC that you buy, if you have personal experience with the cell line, we would like to know every little detail on how you've handled it. Because on our end, we don't do R&D on your cell line. We don't have time to play with this most of the time. And we just have one shot at it. So whatever information you can provide, once again, if you have grown the cell line in your hands, in your company, we would like to get every single detail. And this is why we would like to get technical people on the phone. Hope I answered the question. Yes, thank you, Lana. Um, our next question is for Jerry Ann. Uh, if your cells are not grown with serum or trypsin, is bovine or porcine virus te testing required? It, it actually is not required, but I would be asking you a lot of questions about that. I would be asking you for a full history of your cell line. And, and oftentimes, if you don't have that answer or you can't tell me with certainty how many passages um, the, the cell line is beyond the use of serum or trypsin, I'm going to recommend it as a cautionary note. Remember that full characterization of your master cell bank is one-time testing. And my advice to all of my clients is not to try to save money here, as this is the beginning of your entire uh, manufacturing process. Thank you very much. Um, good advice. And now um, the next question is for Heather. Do you validate or qualify test methods or protocol uh, for MCB characterization, for example, mycoplasma, sterility, and other tests? Yes. Um, as mentioned, um, for mycoplasma, uh, mycoplasma stasis testing is performed um, prior to the routine test. Um, and for sterility, the bacteriostasis, fungostasis testing is performed prior to routine testing. Um, this is where the, we spike the, the cell matrix um, with the positive control agents and ensure that we can get appropriate recovery. Um, 
So yes, and those are those are definitely um, requirements. Um, for virus testing, the same thing. Um, and here, not only is it important to show um, whether the cell matrix is interfering, uh, but it's also important to show that the cell matrix isn't cytotoxic or the media, a lot of times it's the media that the cells were maintained in, um, isn't cytotoxic to the indicator cells. Um, so we definitely recommend that that, that testing um, is performed prior to the routine test. Thank you. Um, our next question is for Wei. Uh, the question is, is CO1 barcoding also made by a single supplier, or are there alternative vendors to avoid supply problems? Well, um, I think the CO1 barcoding method, as far as we understand, there's really no commercial available kit. Um, this is actually a quite complex method involving proper design of multiplexed primers. Um, and subsequently either run a PCR amplification and determine the amplicon size or um, potentially having to uh, perform sequencing analyses on the amplicon and compare the results to the public database in order for the species to be determined. Um, it is more or less at this point um, a methodology that has been established, but uh, you know every single laboratory, if they choose to perform this method, will have to have their own homebrewed methods and um, the appropriately designed primers uh, in most uh, in most cases. Um, us, the European Lancaster Labs, we are in the process of developing this method and hope to offer this uh, for identity testing uh, under a GMP uh, environment. And once the method is developed and validated, really all we are looking at with respect to the reagent supply is the primer, the typical PCR reagent, and the sequencing reagents, which is offered essentially by many, many uh, vendors. So there is really no um, supply issues with respect to uh, you know, implementing this particular method. And, and again, that's one of the uh, benefits compared to the isoenzyme analysis, which heavily re rely on or exclusively rely on uh, one vendor's uh, testing kit. Thank you, Wei. Um, our next question is for Lana. The question is, after a cell bank is generated, do you evaluate cell recovery, such as number of cells recovered and cell viability after thawing? What are the typical success criteria you would recommend? Yes, we definitely do. It is a part of our cell bank and batch record, of every cell bank and batch record, including R&D banks. Uh, typically what we do, we, uh, we pull three vials um, at the beginning, middle, and end cell. And we saw them, we count cells, we count by, we look at viability, we look at recovery uh, for a few days and see to make sure that cells recover properly. Uh, during a recovery period, if it's suspension cell line, we'll count them every day pretty much. And if it's adherent cell line, they will be observed every day to, to see how the progression goes. And, um, you know, there's no such thing as typical recommendation. There's an industry standard of 70 plus percent viability. Uh, certain clients that we have um, expect greater than 90 percent viabilities on their uh, bioassay banks. Um, I had a client in my past that uh, we produced cell bank for, and the average viability was 69 percent, and she was extremely happy because these cells were very finicky, and our competitors were only able to achieve 30 percent. So it all depends on your cell line. It depends, depends on what it is. And in general, the rule is 70 or greater. OK, thank you. Um, our next question will be for Jerry Ann. Um, the question is, what is the method to prepare ready-to-use cells for direct bioassay without expansion? Oh, um, that's going to be very, very customized. Um, for, for every uh, RTU cell bank. Um, that's where, as, as Lana has been saying, we really do talk with the clients constantly. Um, we want to talk with the people doing the bioassay. Uh, what makes it so convenient here for us at Lancaster is that we have a very strong bioassay lab ourselves, and so many of the, the, uh, the RTU cell banks that we're making in Lana's group are actually for our uh, lot release bioassay clients. So there is just a huge wealth uh, of knowledge here. 
um, in, in talking about what the cells are expected to do at the time the vial is cracked and they are plated for use in the bioassay. Um, certainly then I would also add that um, we, we are happy to make RTU bioassay banks for, for clients who are not doing their bioassay with us, and there it's our preference to talk with the actual operators um, who are performing the bioassay so we can find out what's important to them. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, our next question is for Wei. Um, are there other DNA fingerprinting techniques available for identity testing? Yeah, absolutely. There have been multiple methods uh, for DNA fingerprinting that can be perhaps applied for identity testing. Um, but I think we have talked about it, and I think Joey and also stressed why you know the CO1 barcoding method was the preferred method um, was because of the, the sensitivity and the the number of species that it cover and the tremendous amount of the public the sequence information that's available and maintained in the database, um, you know, for the most commonly used species within the biopharm industry, the species, the species identification can be definitively made um, using either, um, based on either DNA size of the amplicon or the sequence analysis. So this really makes the CO1 barcoding method stands out and, and many people um, agree that that is one of the best uh, options that's out there nowadays uh, for a more standard approach. Wonderful, thank you. Our next question is for Lana. Do you create a specification document prior to generation of a GMP bank identifying the critical parameters for release, such as a minimum viability percent and or precision to final fill cell density? Well, uh, we, what we do, we create a batch record, and that's the document that describes the whole procedure of preparation of, uh, of the cell bank. If there are any criteria like viability, um, we include it in the specifications in the batch record. Uh, batch record is prepared with uh, client's input, and when it, before it finalizes, you know, we email it to the client to look at, so client knows exactly what's in it. Uh, and can make any corrections. So yes, the, the, there is such document, and it is um, cell bank and batch record. Wonderful, thank you. Our next question will be for Jerry Ann. Uh, the question is, is EOPC testing expected for an early phase IND submission? Not necessarily, and, that, and that's one of the gray areas that I think Wei alluded to in her presentation. Um, Certainly you want to do extensive characterization of your master cell bank, but if, if your manufacturing process isn't laid down in stone at the early stages, we do have many clients who, who will hold off on testing, uh, on doing the full cell line characterization on the end of production cells, and instead they'll do that on, on the working cell bank. Um, but, but certainly by the time that you're um, in phase two, getting ready to go in phase three, I strongly recommend um, that you nail down that production process and that you do the full characterization on your end of production cells. Thank you. Our next question will be for Wei. Uh, this person says, Wei, I'm interested in next-gen sequencing as a replacement for cyoenzyme. Can Eurofins do this? Um, yes. Um, I'm not quite sure whether everybody um, is aware, but Eurofins is, uh, has a huge network of laboratories uh, for global um, service. So one of the uh, companies that's under the Eurofins organization is called Medigenomics, and they have the expertise as well as experience to handle next-gen sequencing um, project, uh, both for you know as an identity test as well as for for potential for the characterization of the of the cell line. Okay, thank you. Um, our next question is for Lana. Who, uh, she, uh, this person asks, do you maintain the cell record fills, and how, if so, how long will you keep the records? Uh, well, we keep them forever. Uh, they're scanned in electronically, and uh, electronic records maintain forever. Okay, thank you. 
Um, our next question is for Jerry Ann. Is karyotyping acceptable as an indication of genetic stability? You know, it, it, it used to be used quite a number of years ago, but it really is only effective at the very gross level. I think um, that today, you know, given the, the variety of, of uh, assays that, that Wei described, um, we, we certainly can, can go a lot deeper than, than um, gross structure at the chromosomal level. My preference really would be to, to do northern, southern sequencing, um, copy number by PCR, what, what have you. Okay, thank you. Um, our next question will be for Lana. Could you please comment on your experience and capabilities for large adherent cell bank growth and expansion? For example, do you utilize cell factories, hyperstack flasks, or standard T flasks only? Uh, we have experience with all kinds of uh, scenarios, um, and uh, out of multi layers, my favorite are 850 uh, five layer flasks. They're really nice to use, um, easy, um, and and provide enough surface. However, um, I like to use them for cell bank expansions, uh, post bank expansions, not for cell banks itself. The reason being, um, when you have five layers in the flask, uh, unfortunately in the microscope you cannot see all five layers. When I make a cell bank, when my group make a, makes a cell bank, I really like to see every single flask at every stage at the harvest level. Uh, I want to make sure that my cell culture is the same in every flask, uh, that there is nothing else that looks strange. So if you have multi-layers, you cannot truly say that you have seen it all. Um, so I do not recommend using it for cell banking. I don't like using it for cell banking. Um, but what we do, we mostly, for cell banks, we use T300s. And uh, yes, we have done large cell banks with T300s. Uh, we have a significant um, large group of people that can handle this number of flasks. Uh, we have done 500 vials and more uh, adherent cell banks very, very successfully uh, with the viability in 90s. And um, what I do in this case, we have a large number of T300s and I have significant number of people processing. Um, but we do look at every flask. Obviously, if you have a very small group of people, if you have two, three people only, uh, and you have to make a large bank, you probably have to go this route because you can't you know, have cells sitting on ice for 10 hours. But it's not my preference and that's something that I'm always trying to avoid when we get into cell banking scenario. But we do have significant experience with uh, cell factories and multi-layer flasks. That's not a problem. Wonderful. Thank you. Our next question is for Jerry Ann. Is the PCR mycotesting acceptable for bringing in a cell line into banking? If it has been shown to uh, be comparable to the compendial method, absolutely. Um, we, we have a rapid mycoplasma method um, available here at Lancaster, which we have validated and demonstrated to be comparable to the 28-day assay. And of course, um, we will accept results from that assay to uh, give seed cells entry into our GMP production suite. Okay, great. Our next question will be for Lana. How do you control or mitigate DMSO exposure when producing a large bank vials? Usually ice is not allowed in some clean rooms, hence the question. That's what he said. Okay, this question actually has two parts. Part one, which is second in the question, is how do we deal with, how do we keep everything cold? So um, yeah, unfortunately ice is not allowed. I love ice too. Uh, but uh, there are commercially av available uh, cooling racks, uh, which you could purchase, and there are cool packs that you can purchase. So pretty much you place your vial in, in the cooling racks, and it keeps temperature very, very well. Uh, it keeps them cold. And then you take your bottle um, with cells, and you place them onto cool packs, and you could put cool packs around it uh, to keep it cold as well. So there are options there. 
Um, and the first part of the question, how do we keep DMSO exposure to a minimum? Um, you're, typically what we're trying to do if a uh, client requires 5% you know, or 10% uh, final of DMSO, we harvest all the cells, uh, we pull all the cells together into volume that is less than a half of the final volume. So if we have 500 vial bank, uh, we need to make sure that when we pull cells together, it's about you know 200 mils. Then we count cells, we do all the final calculations, we figure out what volume we need, and then at the very last moment when everything is figured out, we add um, the MSO with additional media. Um, and right from there, we set the timer and we start filling vials. So the larger the bank is, the more operators I'll have filling. Uh, when we were filling 1,100 vial bank, we had about nine people in the room working together. So it all you, you have to try to get it in the cryo freezer in about an hour. That's ideal. Um, so the, the, the larger bank you have, the more people you have, uh, provided you have resources. Um, obviously, if you don't have enough resources, you'll go over an hour. It's usually not detrimental for the majority of the cell lines, but for some it may be. Some cell lines are more sensitive to DMSO than others. Uh, if you have a case when, we, we had a case when a uh, client requested us to use uh, special media uh, from, a ven uh, from a vendor that um, already had DMSO in it. In this case, we had to freeze in this media. So in this case, we had no choice uh, but resuspend all the cells, all the cell pellets that were coming out uh, in this media. Um, it's not ideal, uh, and it's rarely the case. But once again, all you can do in this case to, to work as fast as you can and to put as many people as you can at the final stage of violin. OK, thank you, Anna. Um, our next question will be for Jerry Ann. Should viral testing be performed on the seed bank prior to bringing it into the cell banking facility? I like that question. Um, typically, all that we require is a sterility negative and a mycoplasma negative. However, over my years of cell banking, there have been a handful of clients for whom I did ask that they perform some viral testing before I would allow the cells to come into my suite. And, and that was because for some reason or other, together we determined that their cell lines were at risk for containing a virus. Now, that said, we have extensively uh, validated our cleaning procedures for all of our laboratories and certainly for our GMP production suites to be highly effective um, at inactivating antiviruses, even the most um, uh, resistant virus to inactivation. And we make those validation records available to all of our uh, cell banking clients and indeed all of our clients who, who are concerned about viral cross-contamination. Okay, we're just about out of time. Thanks so much, um, everyone, for those insightful answers. We'll follow up with all the unanswered questions with each individual after the webinar. Um, uh, if your questions were not answered, they, they will be addressed via email. If you'd like to request a copy of today's presentation, please send an email to the address shown on the screen. I want to thank the audience for their interesting questions, our speakers for their presentations, and our sponsor, Eurofins Lancaster Laboratories, for making today's educational webcast a valuable experience. This webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through May 2016. You'll receive an email from Pharmaceutical Technology alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. Please invite your colleagues who may have missed this live event by forwarding them the announcement. Thank you again for attending today's webcast, Practical Guidance for Successful Mammalian Cell Banking and Cell Line Characterization. Thanks again. <laughs>